Um, so we've talked about uh, finding uh, uh, potentially counterparts for uh, at other wavelengths for some FRBs. I just wanted to kind of just to get a sense of scale of what's feasible and what's difficult. Um, so um, one question, and I think we've talked about this a little bit, are gamma ray detections viable in these models where a large fraction of the energy actually comes out at other wave bands? Just to give you a sense, um, the gamma ray emission from uh, GRB, it should be GRB, or GW170817, was about 10 to the 47 ergs and was barely detected at 40 megaparsecs, just to kind of set the scale. Um, and this is a plot from Ben showing um, the expected gamma ray fluences for, um, uh, I think this is mainly localized events, relative to the detection threshold. And you can see that we're about four or five orders of magnitude off. Um, in any case, in the optical, an energy, again, just to set a scale, an energy of 10 to the 46 ergs emitted in a millisecond is equivalent to about magnitude 21 um, at a distance of 100 megaparsecs in typical observations that are done as part of optical time domain surveys. So for example, for ZTF, that would be about a three sigma detection in a single frame. So not something that's very easy to pick out um, as a counterpart to an FRB. Uh, and these are at fairly small distances. Um, another um, point I wanted to pick up on is this question of um, um, host galaxies and the demographics. Uh, so again, just to give you a sense, um, the picture has somewhat changed with a few um, objects and taking um, uh, one of them phase lesson, I don't remember which number it was, about small number statistics. Um, we're sitting in a regime where it might actually be quite difficult to definitively say what kind of channels are producing the sources as power FRBs because it's starting to bunch up between uh, things that uh, only track stellar mass or uh, star formation rate or a mix of uh, several different channels with you know 20% of this, 30% of that. So we're going to have to see how, how that um, shapes up with larger numbers, but um, we're not sitting in one extreme or the other uh, at the moment. Uh, okay, um, another uh, point I wanted to make is that the discussion today between the talks about uh, finding counterparts, looking at host galaxies, and then Brian's talk about using FRBs as probes, I think it's becoming highly reminiscent of many other um, fields in astronomy, type 1a supernovae, gamma ray bursts, quasars, where uh, there's this kind of um, uh, dual efforts to both understand the physical nature of these events and at the same time, independent of our understanding of what they are, use them as tools for, uh, to answer other questions uh, in, in um, uh, cosmology, in, um, in black hole formation, galaxy evolution, and so forth. And it looks like the FRB field is kind of starting to enter that same, uh, th that, that same um, um, approach and, and similar bifurcation of efforts uh, between understanding the progenitors, understanding the emission mechanism, and using them as, as tools. Um, I wanted to start with a few guiding questions, which I think we've touched on, but I really want to kind of push on these and get the, the uh, panel members and the audience um, input on. Uh, so as a community, and by community here, I mean both the teams that are searching for FRBs and more broadly people who are interested in questions related to these sources and, um, and in their use as probes, are we optimizing the potential for real-time and long-term follow-up observations with the current uh, mode of um, observations and dissemination of, of information. Um, what observational resources uh, would be required to build the kind of FRB samples that are going to be large enough to answer the questions that we've been addressing? Um, both what the progenitors and the engines are um, and how to use them efficiently as probes of, um, of the intergalactic medium and galaxies. So we're likely talking about samples of order 100 or hundreds of events, maybe even thousands is what we're doing now scalable to that level. Um, what are effective ways to probe the nature of FRB engines by studying other astrophysical systems? And so we heard a little bit about this, um, looking at local magnetars as potential analogs or not, superluminous supernovae, gamma ray bursts, pulsars. How are we going to study these other systems in a way uh, that will focus our understanding of what phenomena might be related to FRBs? Um, and I wanted to kind of, uh, in particular, we've been talking a lot about magnetars. So I wanted to just remind everybody of this famous quote from Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> that would be, we call a magnetar by any other name would smell as sweet. So um, we just, I think, again, need to be cautious about what we mean uh, when we talk about these kind of systems. Magnetar, neutron stars, when we're comparing galactic populations and extragalactic populations, 
when we're comparing them to other transients, we just need to be cognizant that different communities have uh, different ways of defining things that we end up calling the same. Uh, so not to be uh, overdrawn by that. So I just wanted to open this up uh, to any of the panel members to pick up on any of these points and get going. One of the things okay, I keep forgetting. Uh, so, so one of the things that motivated uh, so so anyways, we talked about many magnetar models. I don't want to go into the details. One of the things that motivate us, uh, uh, you know, thinking about whether the emission site is close to the engine or far away, um, uh, is is whether is is related to whether magnetars uh, uh, eject material. We, we've heard for the giant flare there was evidence from a radio afterglow that it ejected a lot of baryons, and if those were very frequent. For magnetar flares, even of weaker energy, you could imagine making it hard for a radio pulse to get out from a heavily repeating source. So I guess, I guess, there's a question kind of for Fernando, which is, if it was, do we have any evidence? What do we have evidence for in terms of mass ejection from weaker flares besides the giant ones? Uh, uh, do we do we expect that this, that you know, if you have a flare, it would sort of black out the engine for a bit, um, or, or you know, what is the evidence along those lines? If any, <laughs> close to no, I would say. <laughs> Uh, I mean, in the giant meaning flares, we can rule it course, out, or meaning that it's hard to actually. Uh, it, no, mm, it's observationally hard. I think. I mean, one possible evidence might be. I mean, evidence. I, I don't know if we can call it mass eject. I don't know, or magnetosphere disturbing, or I don't know how to call that. Which is um, the r the the plot that I showed, where you see the quenching of the radio emission during the burst. Those are short bursts, so 10 to the 38 Earth per second, millisecond, 10 milliseconds, so very short. So s uh, there, in that moment, somehow the radium engine got quenched because of this burst. So something happened in the magnetosphere due to the bursts or connected with the burst that somehow um, had a disturbance of the radio coherent emission. Apart from that, from short bursts, I would say none that I that I remember. I don't know if if Vicky remembers something, but uh. well, the, um, so it, we have tried this many occasions. You have to get the X-ray and radio telescopes to observe at the same time, and you have to get the source to cooperate. And uh, the source doesn't always cooperate, and that's um, in that case it did. The one that Nanda's talking about, it did. Um, but uh, that was not a, um, well, that was a high magnetic field radio pulsar where we saw that. And so that might not have anything to do with the sort of radio emission that you see uh, in magnetar outbursts. Um, it, it could be, but it, some, uh, some people argue, like it was Maxime Ludikoff who was arguing that this was um, not, that this was, um, you know, the, the, the radio emission that got quenched was the standard radio emission not the um, outer magnetosphere radio emission that you think, or the ar that's argued to be there in magnetar outbursts. So yeah, it's a Maxime argument. Uh, yeah, and just to add to that, there are <coughs> our, uh, moding pulsars that show this as well, where the radio and X-ray are anti-correlated with each other. Yeah. But they don't show bursts. No, they don't show okay. bursts, but that's uh, that's different. This is the Hermsen yeah, papers. This is mode switching, yes. right? Yeah, this is mode switching, I yeah. yeah. But, uh, I mean, I you can use it to... I don't think it's exactly the same. Sorry? Or, I don't think it's exactly the same as this case. I mean, this is also something that... No, that's true, but I think I agree with Vicky as well that this is not obviously the same case as what we're potentially talking about for FROBs. Yeah. The, the other thing is, is that you might hope that maybe when there's an injection of mass that you might... Um, I'm wearing one. Um, uh, you might hope that there's um, something to see in the period or the period derivatives, but even after the giant flare, for reasons we don't understand, the period and the period derivative didn't show any evidence for having all that material blasted off. So even even less likely to see anything in the timing for a smaller flare. But I don't know, Vicky, if, is there any any timing behavior that's correlated with flares that you've seen? Uh, yeah, generally. Um, generally, the um, p dots get very large after magnetar outbursts. They they get the, the magnitude of the p dots very, uh, and then you have a, a recovery. Period. Um, so yes, it depends on the on the on the source. For example, what he mentioned. I mean, the giant flare of 1806. 
did not show large PDOT changes. Well, for example, 1048, that probably is the one it does. Yeah, so I, uh, so I think 1806, that's probably, well, I think that's more of an exception. Like most of them, I think, show timing variations at the time of output. To get back to Brian's original thing, the this is primarily, I guess, related to repeating FRBs, and we have seen separations down sub-second separations between some of these bursts, which we can still call independent bursts. So, so that I, was my broader fact, point: is if you're going to yeah. make the burst come from magnetosphere, you have to have a very clean environment. Right. Uh, and and so if the, if one burst is making too much crud, then it's going to be hard for the next one to get out. And that's, that's right. And we've certainly it. seen sub-second separations between independent bursts for 12, 11, or 12, 13. Sorry, if it comes from the crust, you can have sub second separation into different regions of the crust where you stress and you have a flare from one kind. The, well, the trigger comes from the crust, not the Right, uh, yeah, yeah. I think you can get flares that quickly. It's, I guess, it's a question of whatever that mechanism is, does it get quenched if there's too much material? <laughs> uh, so. so what happens if for a intermediate case, where, for example, we, have, we know that there are no sequence, is there a mass reduction in the Can you turn your microphone on? Let's define what you mean for mass, e well, I mean, what you mean for mass ejection. If mass ejection, I mean, if evidence for mass ejection mean that we see a radio counterpart or an expanding shell, no, we don't see it because I'm not sure it was, they were all observed deep enough and good enough to say if there was or not. So, and okay. no, not for, I mean, for the giant flare of 1806, yes. For the deep, I mean, more, more normal bursts, there are no other evidence of this mm -hmm. kind. But I'm not sure we can really put a limit on this because the observations are very sparse. Right. So let me, let me push so we don't spend all of our time talking about magnetars. Let me push a little bit on, um, on point number three, which is somewhat related of how do we make potential progress on FRBs by studying other astrophysical systems. So let me make a concrete suggestion, and maybe people can tell me if it's crazy. But you know, now that CHIME is finding so many FRBs, we're not lacking for statistics. Um, and ASCAP is finding localization. There are enough localizations coming in. Is there any reason not to spend a lot of telescope time on some of the other facilities staring at other types of sources that we might suspect to be associated with FRBs uh, as a way of actually seeing if we can, you know, you might as well, if you're gonna point somewhere on the sky, why not point where there was a GRB 10 years ago or a superluminous supernova or something else? So any thoughts on that? I guess audience or? Um, so the, one of the obvious difficulties and the thing that always gets you a loophole, like if you don't find anything, is this apparent clustering of the bursts. It's very extreme for 12.0.0.2. It's maybe unclear for, for example, Chime, how strongly clustered in time they are. Um, but if you have any sort of clustering, you can always just invoke, oh, you know, it's extremely highly clustered or we just haven't, you know, it, you really have to observe substantially longer than Poissonian, but Poisson statistics, statistics would suge suggest make any sort of meaningful. So it is difficult. Um, yeah, that's fine. But if you're yeah, yeah. finding FRBs, let's say, with um, parks by pointing somewhere random, which is saying you can point at that random place and get FRBs anyway that are not related yeah, no, to the I, I agree. If you have time and you need to point somewhere, you may as well point somewhere where you can look for, look for repeats. That's the the true. flip side of that, though, is that with enough exposure, given that these single-dish fields of view are large, you will pick up FRBs by chance. Sure. And sure, but you, you know the positions well, and so you not, can always follow not up. as well for parks or No, no, I mean the position so of the sources and the redshifts are known in advance, and so if you see something, then you can go back and see if you find repetitions. And right. You're not starting from nothing. Right, yeah. right, but, but just sky exposure, given the rates, you can predict that in a survey of 100 hours, you will pick up N of these by chance. Brian? Yeah, I think the obvious instrument for that is fast, though. Right, you want to take your most the most gain you can possibly get if you're going to go and try to do this, and it's going to sort of uh, uh, help with Laura's issue of uh, intermittency as well, because you're going to see right. more fainter pulses. And and the smallest it's beam of the, the smallest beam, yeah. set, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, can can anybody say what strategies Fast is is using? Who presented the Fast result the other day? Was that Bing? Bing, Bing. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, 
Do you, do you know do you know anything about the strategies that Fast is using? Like, is it doing targeted searches or blind searches and looking for fast radio bursts? Blind search uh, just uh, started uh, because the, the field is small, so the chance is low. But uh, it seems to be consistent with the the prediction. The rate is similar to to parks, for example. Um, the very first one, uh, I think the uh, DM is relatively large, about thousand, which is also consistent because you can see deeper, farther distance, but with a smaller field width. So it seems to be consistent. And for targeted search, mm -hmm. um, of course, the, the 12.11.02 has been monitored. For the others, it's just uh, look, looking at the properties of the, say, the verse itself and see, it's just a guessing. The, the one I showed yesterday, it was purely just based on luminosity. It looks like it's a relatively low luminosity consistent with uh, repeaters. And they just uh, went there and uh, there are a lot of re repeating bursts. So uh, there's a plan of following some of the other candidates. We don't know whether, uh, whether we can catch more repeaters. Well, actually, I want to make two comments. Uh, one, in your previous slide, I think you are depressing the field. So if you can go back to your previous slide. Uh, and on this uh, previous one, yeah. So 10 to the 46 ergs is 21 magnitude um, in, uh, it, it's, okay, so th they, uh, in, I think it is 21 magnitudes at larger uh, distances. So, uh, so I think you should. Uh, I think it should be possible to uh, see such things with ZTF, but certainly with uh, let's say LSST, you should be, be able to see them to fair, fair distances. So I think that l trying to see with the optical uh, telescopes, uh, with something like LSST, it should be a doable uh, thing, and it would have a wide field of view. And if you have a thousand bursts per day on the on sky, and it sees them to uh, several hundred megaparsecs, there should be a possibility to see them on. The, th th so this is one comment. The other thing is that uh, I think that a very important thing would be to to detect the nearest FRB possible. I think this is I think this uh, I think this is the probably the most promising thing uh, to to do to to find the nearest one, and then hammer on that one. Uh, but uh, but for this you need wide field, uh, shallow surveys rather than uh, very deep. Uh. I think I mean part of the issue is that ZTF is surveys are thirty second exposure, so if it's really a millisecond, you're averaging over a long time. But you could use you could Tomo he goes in at a half second. You could use UltraCam at a millisecond, and then it's much easier. So. <laughs> Same vein, I, I would say, keep observing the same source has a lot of vir that virtue. So for, I have a question. For example, if the repeater keep repeating for the next 10, 15 years, what's the prospect of getting the underlying rotation period using the same technique that we get, we, we do for red, for example? Is there a prospect? Okay, I, Is there a prospect I, getting I can, that? I can comment on that. I mean, there's this. If um, you have many more, a lot more data. In well, more, is there a prospect? Lot more data. There's the breakthrough listen observation, for example, where there's over a hundred bursts in a one-hour period, and you don't have to worry about linking those observations across different sets or coherence. You know that that was a coherent data set. There's a hundred bursts in a one-hour period, and we've searched it pretty exhaustively. And if you allow for a short enough period, like a millisecond, then yes, sure, you can say it's a millisecond period, but that's not saying much. Um, if you allow for any kind of epicycle, like an orbit period or a wide emission phase, then you can fit those bursts. But otherwise, no, there is not a periodicity that's obvious there. And, and I don't think that more bursts from FRB 121102 will ever improve that particular aspect of it, of an underlying periodicity. Yeah, but we have 100 bursts in an hour it's not going to get any better than that as far as this technique goes. I mean, others might disagree with me there, but. Yes. So I want to make a comment that uh, I would suggest that not doing the occurrence 
uh, uh, time series as uh, the periodicity search, do the PA, do the polarization angle, which should be modulated by the rotation instead of the occurrence. Uh, could I yeah, maybe bring it to the other end of the spectrum of instruments? And I, I wondered, would it be useful or possible to do, rather than you know focusing on like ZTF, LSST style, really wide, expensive, uh, big instruments. If I feel like, uh, at least in the gamma ray, they've kind of moved towards a CubeSat direction <coughs> of instruments. Would it be reasonable to try to do that with FRBs, where you have a very small, very inexpensive instrument, but it's, you know, maybe it can't do as well as a bigger thing, but it can be paired with a radio interferometer, and then you catch all FRBs in real time. Is that something that would be useful? Uh, at what rate now? Um, X-ray, I mean, I know I know we already do this in the gamma rays. I, I don't know if there's any CubeSats in the optical yet. There are CubeSats in the optical, but I think the challenge is just getting enough photons. So you need a large collecting area, both in X-rays and uh, optical. So if you just get one photon in a millisecond, you, are, we, are you sure that it is associated with that FRB? It's really yeah. hard. But if you could catch them all, you know, literally every FRB that you see, <laughs> <laughs> is that, yeah, you could, would, you that could would those limits add be up. more useful than, you know, just uh, small yeah. statistics on a I few? If you need, I mean, I guess that at least that it was for GRBs, before that you need one detection. Yeah. So you need to be sure they emit in that band, and then you go for the population. But mm -hmm. going blind, it's a bit, nobody will fund it, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, so let me, again, connect this to the first question. Um, since there's a lot of discussion here of possible resources that are around that can do some of this work of follow-up, um, is there a general sense that the way things are happening now is good enough and we should continue this way, or that a change in philosophy or mentality or pace would, would be helpful, opening things up uh, more than they are now? I have um, just, uh, I was just thinking about point one as we were uh, uh, sitting here, but I was just thinking about ways to, you know, I think a common theme yesterday and today has been that localization is really important, whether it comes from the FRB itself or, you know, from any contextual information uh, from, from where the FRB happens to be sitting with respect to galaxy catalogs. So are there, are people thinking about, for instance, utilizing you know, LSST and the photometric redshift that that um, whole catalog will provide to cross-correlate it with, for instance, um, you know, the arc minute positions that will be coming out. Um, and I think thinking along those lines, um, well, you know, how to basically localize these events and use all the resources possible that will be uh, available coming online in the future is, is going to be a healthy thing. Yeah, so I would just add, so along those same lines, um, I wonder if CHIME is doing anything um, currently, given that they see the whole sky, are there any kinds of cross-correlations going on with, you know, positions of other transients or? Yeah, so uh, I don't know if Kendrick is around, but uh, so there is a student, Masood, uh, his student Masood is working on 2D cross-correlations of uh, FRBs with known galaxies. It's obviously hard because you need to know the positions and everything reasonably well, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, so that's he. It's been worked. On, it's been wor being worked on, not been worked on. So it requires a population of known, known of sources with known redshifts. So uh, LSST would be useful for photometric redshifts in general, but I don't think there's enough power uh, without a spectroscopic sample yeah. to do the two two D correlations. Yeah. I believe for the real fast one that Casey showed, they are using photometric. Galaxy catalog. Uh, no, it's not a photometric catalog. It's a photometric re redshift from the imaging data that exists. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sh Shri Harsh, it seemed like from the theory paper that they wrote, the forecasting paper, all they needed was kind of this resources with arc minute resolution, and you already get a pretty good constraint on the redshift distribution of FRBs. So presumably, you guys can already do it. Yeah, I'm not an expert on this, but perhaps Daniele wants to add something. Yes. Yeah, um, I at the moment, most of the sources, as you can see in the papers, are localized at tens of arc minutes, which I'm, so uh, we are doing some, um, Masood and Kendrick are doing some preliminary uh, studies, uh, and um, uh, on 
uh, on my side, we are trying to improve by using the raw voltages, the localization down to one arc minute. And at that point, uh, you can really have like a, a cross correlation that is uh, meaningful. Um, uh, but it's a work in progress, so it, it's going to take still a few months. Um, sorry, well, just to confirm, so it sounds like this is cross-correlation with just galaxies and trying to match the um, DM inferred redshift with... Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure about the, the detail of the okay. uh, of the cor correlation, but yeah, it's, it's like correlating structures in the universe with distribution of uh, stereo bars. I see. Okay. okay, we have a question there. So uh, I don't understand something. Maybe you can clarify it for me. So Levin here is saying that the magnetars in the galaxy are like uh, thousand years old. Uh, assuming democratically, meaning everybody thinks that that these these are magnetars. Uh, FRB twelve eleven o two is at about a gigaparsec. Correct. Uh, I would assume that magnetars are at kiloparsec. This gives me 10 to the power 12 in luminosity, while in the age, it is only a factor of 30. So it is unthinkable to someone naive that a factor of 30 can get you down 10 to the power 12 in terms of uh, luminosity. And I would assume that your chime or something, isn't it routinely observing magnetars? Should it, shouldn't it have detected a magnetar? So it's 30 to translate it into 10 to the power 12 sounds funny. Well, I, That's I why we didn't think FRBs existed in the first place. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we saw pulsars and we thought this can't be the same thing. <laughs> Um, because the, you know, they would have to be at this amazing distance. So it has to be something different. But yet today, by popular vote, <laughs> it's magnetar. We have a magnetar. Yeah, that's just because the theorist just turns knobs until they can't turn them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a millisecond magnetar. Cause what else could it be, right? Uh, but Andre, you haven't got any other knobs to turn. Andrew, you're just proving again the worth of popular vote. To be fair, after, 30, uh, after 12 orders of magnitude, the magnetar bursts are much, 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 much brighter than FRBs. So you get like maybe, I don't know, 10 or 10 of those orders of magnitude back. No, no, but uh, what I think so what he's saying is... Yeah. Oh, sure. Wait, so millisecond pulsar names. Mm. Millisecond pulsars are excellent pulsars. <laughs> nah. <laughs> you don't do anything. Well, okay. So I'll just, number one, we're in the northern hemisphere. Most magnetars are in the southern hemisphere. Uh, but there are, s <laughs> but there are some magnetars in the northern hemisphere, including ones that have recently been in outburst, and uh, we we haven't seen uh, anything from them. But uh, I think, um, yeah, that that the, the argument has always been that the magnetars that are in FRBs are special magnetars, not yeah. But, Yes, and I think w your point is very well taken. I mean, that's exactly what was it was we were saying oh, a little you're earlier. It's a trivial amount of no, no, you're not understanding no. what I'm saying. No, the, Can the I'll repeat. The I agree with you. Full stop. Somehow we've been drawn <laughs> back to magnetars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Though. I have to, I have to <laughs> respond. <laughs> 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 No, model. I mean, there are some magnetar models where there's no memory of what's going on around it. The magnetar models that we've developed and the ones that Andre Belabrov have developed rely, rely critically on the fact that these magnetars have been flaring at a much higher rate. So there's a material ahead of them for these shocks to run into, or there's a pulsar wind that's more powerful than 
the old magnetars in our galaxy would produce pulsar winds. So it's not just a you know matter of the flare makes makes this radio emission. There's something having to do with how active the source is. Uh, and so maybe this very short period of time early in a magnetar's evolution where it's actually, you know, active enough to create the medium ahead of it that's going to be, make FRBs possible is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, we could talk about it. Uh, yeah. Can okay, I comment on this um, a second? I, 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 I want to, okay, go ahead. I can pull you back to the second question if you want. <laughs> and yeah, and I wanted to get to your slide too. Oh, that's um, fine. You can take that. Um, <laughs> if I remember the second is, do, you know, do we have to do things qualitatively different going, going forward? I, I think... If the first 10 that we've identified and localized uh, are representative of the next 100, I think probably not. That is to get um, host properties uh, on even at rates of 100 per year, that would be feasible. The ones that do give me pause are the ones like Professor Fong showed where you don't see anything in the location. And there are, I think there's of the 10, there's probably one that gives me some pause. I was going to say the false positive rate that Tarna showed, 10% false positive rate. I mean, of the 10, one is wrong. And certainly, yeah. I would be willing to bet which one that one is. <laughs> and so then the, the, the question is, how, many, how much resources do you put into those 10%? Um, mm -hmm. And from my, from my own perspective, I'm as worried about the biases that are leading the FRB population as much so as I would be towards the biases on, on the follow-up effort. Um, so there needs to be work on certainly on both sides of Understanding what is the population that we do get to uh, to follow up, um, and then what are the ones that are that are either being falsely identified or or just very difficult to the point where you don't um, but don't make a, a secure identification. So, so, so just um, just to put push back on that a little bit. I mean, when we again look at the uh, example of let's say GRBs, long and short GRBs, it took well more than a decade, a couple of decades, to build up samples of of order 100 um, host galaxies. It's not because there was a lack of sources to follow up. It's just building up the resources of the community and devoting it while other things are happening at the same time. Um, so I'm not convinced it's trivial to do 100, but. Yeah, it's, it's of order an hour a source. It's 10 nights of data. It's not that much, um, yeah. honestly. It, but that's, that's for the e easier ones. Again, the 10% the that are challenging, that could easily burn you another 10 or 20 nights. And then there's HST and Alma and yeah, all yeah. of these things. Yeah. <coughs> so. Yes, Ellie. So you were asking about the things that might need to be done differently. When, so it's not clear to me whether there is a coordination uh, with uh, optical observations in overlapping fields that would reach a significant uh, relevant sensitivity with, the, with radio efforts. Because in principle, this is somewhere where you, you can really improve the, uh, maybe you detect something, and if not, you really improve the limits, the current limits that you have. And, but if there is no coordination with suitable optical for, uh, obser observatories, then. Uh yeah, I was just going to reiterate um, what Ido said earlier, is that um, while LIGO has been a little bit boring for EM observers, or I mean, sorry, O3, um, uh, I should qualify. Um, the, all that infrastructure is in place, you know, rapid follow-up or cross-correlation with any type of data stream you can imagine. And so I think that's really a, a great resource that this community could tap into um, in terms of communicating with that community observers. Um, of course, like there need to be um, some guidance as to w on what time scales, what wavelengths, that well, type of there thing. Is th um, there is a significant difference here because the LIGO follow-ups or for neutral yeah. star or whatever, the optical emission would last for hours and days. Yep. And this is something completely different. We don't know whether there is an afterglow at all, and I think it would be best to have a, a simultaneous radio and observation of the same field. Uh, because it, if it is a, a short event, you don't want to, uh, uh, to miss it. And it's, it, it's doable. You don't need big telescopes for that, as also Stero said. But if it's not coordinated and it will not happen, I think w you would be missing a, a, a possible significant way to make progress.
but i mean it would it would help to switch switch it out with the e electron multiplying ccd which would just you know read out at a millisecond for i don't know whether somebody is looking into it but that would be really nice uh i don't know if anyone's working on that because it wasn't really built for frb so it wasn't right. for short integration time so the key was right uh, so how well so is a question how well characterizes the optical variable sky on millisecond time scales at the <laughs> wavelengths that you know sorry um yeah okay you, so i see you. Yeah, it's not very uh, well characterized. Also, uh, if you're just doing image subtraction, then uh, the scintillation and atmospheric effects it themselves are going to cause you know false positives in there. Yeah. I was just going to say so. So there is, I believe, thirty nights of data at one millisecond read time with roughly half degree field of view from the 200 inch staring at M28. So it, it, was, it was looking for Kuiper belt occultations of stars in M28, but it's a, it's a huge field, it's millisecond sampling, and it's at least 30 nights of data. So I'll one just, could characterize, get something from it, I think. I'll make a quick comment about the follow-up business that unlike the GRB case, the radio signature comes last. And so it's not that you can trigger on the radio. You'll have to pre, um, you'll have to be taking data before you get the radio trigger. And, and sometimes, particularly at lower frequencies, those delays can be very substantial compared to the higher energy signatures. There is a nice project led by Jeff Cook out of Swinburne called Deeper, Wider, Faster Survey, where he is coordinating radio telescopes and optical telescopes on, <coughs> but only for about a week, a couple weeks per year, and he needs to get lucky. Yeah. So, yeah, I, to, to do the experiment you propose, you also have to have a yeah an instrument that's matched the field of view of your radio telescope, which is, that that's the big challenge. To, you know, if you're, if you're not going to try to be lucky, but right, if you're trying or to try to... Staring, or if you're staring, or if you're staring, yeah. So uh, I would like to come back to the point which uh, Ellie made and sort of ask a question to the theorists in the group. Are there expected to be afterglows at any uh, on that on any energy scale which would be visible for the low DM FRBs? So is it worth going after low DM FRBs with optical telescopes and trying to find afterglows on a day, few day or a week time scale? I mean, uh, hours hours is possible, but seconds is really hard, right? So you can't slew Palomar in a second, but few hours it's possible. So is it worth setting up a, a logistics chain so that we can get a localization for a bright low DM FRB and then? What a way to rephrase this question. Where, I mean, yeah, FRBs are extremely you know, common in the universe. So if you said everyone made it an afterglow you could detect, you'd have to make sure that was consistent with the fact that we haven't seen these things blindly as something else. Yeah. So that's not a constraint on very low DM Right, so I'd like to be able to establish that if we have different types of transits, they, they, they don't, we can establish they don't make FRBs. <laughs> uh, you know, it would be it would, yeah, it would be amazing, uh, but I think the rates of FRBs are high enough that you know we couldn't have too common of a of a bright thing. Um, but uh, I'll let other theorists opine. Yeah, Vicky, did you want to say something? Uh, to say, um, you know, th one of the reasons that we prioritized publishing repeat quickly was exactly so that people could start following them up. And um, plus, we are in the process of finalizing our public web page where you can go for any of those repeaters and um, we will be posting when they burst next um, as quickly as we can, which at the moment, I don't know, it might be a day or two, but um, uh, eventually we'll try and get that faster. But the point is that if you choose a repeater, uh, you can then go and see, did it burst? Um, um, you might not know immediately, but uh, it'll be available. I have a question that maybe Vicky can answer. Uh, is that correct that if we will see the next giant flare from a galactic magnetar now, which it might happen any time, we will miss the possible FRB again? If any, yep. I'm going to pass that to Srihar. <laughs> uh, we, I mean, we 
we might dis we might detect it uh, detect it in the side lobes of telescopes, but we might throw it out as RFI. No, no, if it happens to be in Chimes field of view right up, we are more likely to throw it away. Sure. Yes, because but we know the X-ray. I mean, if, if, if you're somehow in the side lobe from the X-ray, we will know there is one, you will look for it. Yeah, yeah, we'll be, so what we do is we look for- How probable it is that it will get somehow in some uh, so telescope? Right, for, so for Chime, it's hard because most magnetars are in the south. Uh, <laughs> but that said, other telescopes might see it. So I don't know how ASCAP uh, would see a bright FRB, which is far out in the side lobes. Probably all the 36 beams will light up, and I don't know what you'd do with the, that. Stair could see it. Right, yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. St there is a project called Stair 2. Yeah, but yeah. sensitivity You need is a cool. interferometer observing. That's all you need. This yeah. thing is so bright, you don't have to be in pulsar mode. You could be in imaging mode. I, I, you just I need agree. a interferometer observing above the horizon. That's but all. But I feel the view is very small. It doesn't matter. This thing is so bright, it'll enter through any 100 side lobe. It yeah, doesn't but matter. It'll be flagged as bad data. I mean, it'll almost certainly be flagged. The, but the, you can go and look at the data. You, you just need an interferometer yeah. observing. Yeah. So, so, I mean, are, are there models where you might get a. Uh, uh, FRB like minutes or hours after the giant flare or only like during it and before it? <laughs> Make a model, Brian. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, anyone? Uh, no, in our models at the same time. You mean the giant flare defined by gamma rays or something? Or um, Yeah, yes, but I mean if there's like multiple um, so like, like closely spaced shells at slightly different speeds that sort of catch up with, with each other like minutes or hours after or something? It's usually hard to do that. Be things tend to remember more what the central engine is, how long it's active, meaning the millisecond mm -hmm. light crossing time. They tend, you know, but I don't know, many others have theories. <laughs> but I mean, I just wanted to note for 1806, I think it was, is, is Maura still here or? No, um, she she got on to 1806 with Parks mm -hmm. pretty quickly after the event, like within a few hours, maybe I can't remember. And so they were in pulsar mode, and I, I assume that they looked for individual bursts and didn't see anything. But you, you have to get really lucky for the for the rate to even work. You, there's maybe one FRB per galaxy per century, and if many are repeaters, then actually most galaxies don't have any uh, FRB at all. Or you're lucky and you have one every two seconds. You don't even expect an FRB. But if we have 30 magnetars and they're all no more than a thousand years old, then you know we've you got one. In our galaxy. You, you could expect something much lower in energy than the energy of the FRBs that we see in other galaxies. Okay, let me switch gears a little bit because we have a couple of slides from panel members. If you want to talk about, oh, I just, um, yeah, yeah. Do you want to finish our discussion on the how to read them? How to believe? What size you measure? Oh, there we go. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, uh, so I've put up the. These are the apparently non-repeating, as we call them, right? FRBs uh, that we've, from both ASCAP and DSA down here. I've put up uh, from the emission, oh, I think all of them show emission at this stage. That includes, and don't blame Ryan for this, what we're calling preliminary for this one, people have been calling it elliptical, we don't use that word. <laughs> uh, it for sure shows some emission, uh, TBD, whether that's uh, associated with star formation or not. So hold, hold up on that one. This is 180924. Um, also show, they all show emission. Um, that one's, several of them, the emission looks uh, unlike star formation and, you know, your galaxy speak, they're called liners, um, which is a uh, source of hard uh, emission. But what is certainly holding up for a number of these is uh, separations that are uh, quite a few kiloparsecs, five kiloparsecs, uh, localizations well beyond in this case, and I think for sure in this case, uh, the bulk of the stars or star forming regions of those galaxies. Um, so whether or not they are even forming stars, uh, it's clear they're not forming, they're not occurring within the, the star forming regions of those galaxies. This one is uh, almost certainly red and dead. Of course, the associations uh, are less secure. Uh, and this is the one that I was mentioning where um, we do have a detected source within the localization, um, but it's very faint. Now that those types of sources take uh, considerably more resources to, to follow up, um, unlike the, the rest of the panoplia. And those are at the same redshift and only a few tens of kiloparsecs apart. So there's at least one FRB in emerging uh, pair of galaxies. In fact, the star formation appears elevated in the host. So 
to ask, so as Tane pointed out, for the DSA localization, there's certainly room to hide a dwarf galaxy um, in the foreground in front of S1, um, which would be possibly more on the bullseye, just like what Menfai showed yeah, look before. That one looks exactly like your, your before yeah, slide. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly there's like, well, I forget now, half a unit of redshift in which you could hide a 121102 style host galaxy and not be able to see it. Well, um, we saw the statistics from the first talk, which is that if you go deep enough, you'll definitely see galaxies. Right. So then, so so, what does that association mean? And likewise, I would I could ask the same thing for that last one. Uh, that one's only twenty third magnitude, so it's not quite as um, you know, you'd have if you here this is already twenty third magnitude, I think. If you put it went down to twenty third, several magnitudes deeper, you would definitely see galaxies, statistically speaking. You should still do that. Um, yeah, I think the community needs to come up needs to agree to some extent what what constitutes associations. Uh, we're gonna have to be careful. To what extent we used the DM in, in those associations was, was certainly done for the DSC, DSA event. And I think it's going to depend a bit on your science interests. Um, when it comes to you know, one of the things that excites me the most is measuring a DMZ relation. Uh, there's no way uh, I would ever use a, a burst like this, um, where the DM is now figuring into the, the actual host identification. But if it's too close to the galaxy, then you've got contamination. So it has to be. Sort of ah, no. It has to be just right. I like think that one, yeah. I'm willing to to marginalize over that contamination. That's <laughs> that's a that's a well, good problem to have. It's a good problem. Yeah. Not understanding why is it important that if you integrate deep enough, you will find some dwarf galaxy. I mean, the false positive is said by your radio crosshairs landing on top of an elliptical because not everywhere you point, you find an elliptical. That's right. So that is a secure association. We're speaking of this one. Yeah, in, uh, that's okay. fine in individual cases, but I think yeah. if you find a 10 kiloparsec size galaxy, that's a secure association. Yeah. Both of the both of the last two figures here did not land on a did not land on the host. Well, galaxy. we don't know this redshift yet, so that that could actually be pretty close to L star. Well, sure, but but in principle, there could be a, if you had if you had a deeper image, you would might you would find galaxies that would be potentially better matches, and then you have to rely on the DM. Z relationship to sort out which one you want to believe more. But now it's a circular argument to get to the DMZ. I would not use that case <laughs> in the DMZ analysis. Other thoughts on this? Um, yeah, the other issue I think that we might have with some of these types of events, if, if they are sufficiently far enough out uh, and there is some underlying host, we may not even detect it. Um, so. I don't know. I think that's something worth thinking about. I was just looking at this more. Um, you know, a lot of these, as you said, are kind of on the outskirts of their galaxies, may not even have um, underlying star formation. Is that weird in the Magnetar scenario? Because I would expect them to be correlated with young well, regions. Not almost, according all, to Edo. almost all the Magnetars in our galaxy, which are are older, are all, many of them are sitting in molecular clouds and in very, very messy regions, like the most messy regions you can think of. Right. Is the image image 20 plus, 20 plus it about the galaxy creating on the Yeah, so this, this already is inconsistent with what you see in the Milky Way, I think. <coughs> or just with the expectations, the correlations with star formation or... Like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. To Other ways to make magnetars. Yeah, <laughs> just uh, no, maybe, know, you know, like making yeah. maybe Chris Thompson's right. And this, well, that, that would be another question. Like, well, how could you? It could, you could flip that around, right? Yeah. The, we could say the same thing about neutron star mergers, right? And GRBs. We see that GRBs are offset. We know that they come from, at least in some cases, from neutron star mergers. But the double neutron stars in our galaxy sit in the galactic plane. So you could you could do the same kind of right, just pointing that out. But I think. Uh, can I make a, a comment? It, I think I, it seems to me that the discussion of the observational strategies should be less tightly connected to a particular model assumption. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, unless uh, I mean, let, I think we, we should we should be careful not to switch this. Uh, and, and another comment uh, about uh, there was a question about the afterglows. I think that, uh, I mean, even in the optimistic case, the, where this thing emits, let's say, uh, 10 to the 43 ergs in, uh, 
it's like eight, eight orders of magnitude lower energy than uh, you know, a GRB uh, can energy. So uh, it's uh, even if it does produce afterglows and so on, it would be difficult to see them to a significant distance. So I think you really want to be there on the on the event itself. No, but I mean, if you have a FRB which is uh, really close, uh, if you have a FRB which is say localized to M82 and you go there and you oh, see, yeah. you if, should. If, if you have something that close, yeah. you go every, 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 every telescope would go exactly. and look at you it. You throw everything yeah, at okay, it, Okay, right? but that's uh, okay. yeah. obvious, yeah, of course. Okay. Just, okay. just um, to respond to Ben, uh, the difference is, is that our galactic magnetars are supposedly older than the FRB magnetars, mm -hmm. where in, for the binary neutron stars, they're much younger than the, the uh, other ones. Agreed, we are not connecting everything. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, myself. let me, uh, Brian had a few questions that he wanted to talk about, I think related uh, partly to the same issues, but also the use of um, FRBs as probes. So I don't know, Brian, if you want to expand on that. Um, mo most of it's pretty self-explanatory, but I guess the first question was uh, was just to, count, to counter um, Ido's question, which is what, what, what more observations do we, should we get? And as I sort of flagged in my talk, I think that we might be starting to lag behind in the tools that we're using. And I don't know if Kendrick wants to comment because you and Masood have actually like written one of the, the sort of the sort of traditional extragalactic astronomy papers and applying this to fast radio bursts. Do you think we need a whole new set of tools and calculations and simulations to handle these sort of large scale structure questions or we can just copy things over from what we've done with galaxies? Uh, I think mostly there's an established uh, toolkit in cosmology for computing angular cross-correlations between catalogs. The only thing that's kind of unique about the FRB case is that it can be difficult to disentangle correlations from propagation effects from correlations due to um, like spatial clustering. Uh, so the modeling, the interpretation of the cross-correlations may be a little more difficult. Uh, you need of order uh, 1,000 FRBs to start getting um, interesting cross correlations in a wide variety of models, which we have with Chime. So this is this is something we're working on now, and uh, hope to have something out soon. But when you do like a BAO experiment with Sloan, there are these ways of correcting for non-uniform coverage and other selection effects associated with the survey. Um, those tools aren't directly transferable. Um, how much are you worried in the sort of the analyses that you've done about? correcting for incompleteness and sensitivity and other systematic effects? Yeah, you have to have some um, pres prescription for making random random catalogs. Um, so like in the uh, Chime uh, analysis that we're working on, wh one thing we do is just assume that our um, exposure is uh, independent of RA at a fixed declination. So we make randoms by taking the FRBs that we observe and uh, keeping the declinations fixed and randomizing the RAs. So can you just to clarify, when you said 1,000 FRBs, do you mean 1,000 with just FRBs straight up, no localizations, no host associations? Um, or, oh, yeah. Or do so you mean 1,000 with all this ancillary information? Oh, no, I'm thinking of a situation where you don't have per object host mm -hmm. associations. Uh, and uh, so you're trying to um, establish uh, redshift distribution statistically by um, cross-correlating with um, you know, a, gal a, a, a galaxy survey. Okay. Um, well, uh, uh, to, to jump ahead to the, the third one, um, in previous FRB conferences, maybe because we didn't have any other data to talk about, there was huge discussions about fluxes and fluences and, and, and distributions, and we had a couple of mentions of that, and then we sort of moved on. Um, I'd be curious to, to hear people's thoughts on, you know, just how, how much information is there in flux influences that we don't already have, and, um, you know, can it be combined in some way with other things like DM? Yeah. So I think here we should caution the people who are not as familiar with the radio observations that any measurement of flux or fluence is contaminated by the primary beam of the telescope. Um, and since... <laughs> except except for interferometric 
except for interferometric ones. And yes, so so if you want a clean sample, you can use just um, the ASCAP ones as long as they're in the excluding the outer ring of the path. Um, you can use the inner beam detections. Um, otherwise, everywhere else you have to worry about how far out into the primary beam it was detected, and therefore every fluence or flux is a lower limit on the true value. But if, if you do have a, a single power law describing the fluence distribution as they arrive at your telescope, then signal to noise is a, a pretty good proxy, and it doesn't have these problems. That said, I agree with Vikram's sort of insinuation in the first talk about the log n log s purgatory that we were in for three years. <laughs> yeah. We didn't actually learn very much. Yeah. I, uh, I agree. That's a po that. polite way of saying what I was asking. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Vicky's talk had that terrifying triple detection. Yeah. yeah. And without two of those three detections, you would have thought, oh, cool, that's here. But the position is potentially off a lot. Yeah, so the, the only thing I'll, um, that I didn't show in, in those plots is that when um, an FRB is in a very far side lobe and when it is, um, well, if it's broadband, uh, it has a very clear spectral signature so that we can um, identify with pretty good confidence FRBs that are in the far side lobes and you know, chuck them from the statistical analysis. Now, it will still have some contamination, but it's it's probably going to, it won't be huge. Right. We hope. Yeah, I would say yes, and that this is useful. And the reason why is that we have a DM redshift relation. So flux is going to tell you the luminosity. There's no beaming. Oh. <laughs> I think it's luminosity. F from the GRB, I think, uh, experience, uh, like, people were doing log N, log S, uh, <laughs> modeling, uh, okay. D this didn't uh, prove to be very useful until there were localizations and uh, counterparts. And then uh, things were solved. And I think it probably would be the same here. Daniele, can you say, like, obviously ASCAP is getting localizations right now, but with with the the baseband localization system, like in a year or two's time, like what what is the time sample going to look like in terms of number of localizations and fluxes and all the rest of it? Mm, well, uh, uh, position localization. Yeah. yeah. Well, of yeah. course, uh, chime doesn't have the localization capabilities of ASCAP, so we will be uh, having some uh, probably fraction of um, arc minutes localization. Um, I think it's going to be useful for low DMFRBs to localize a galaxy, uh, nothing inside the galaxy, but still the host. And for far away uh, fast radio bars, too, we can do what Tara was suggesting, basically uh, correlating with known structures in the universe. Um, uh, yes, and uh, I, I think that. Uh, at the moment, we are dumping uh, raw voltages for basically all the chime detections, and uh, I don't think we are we we are two years from from there. I would more say like uh, I don't know four or five months to start localizing with baseband all the FRBs that we get. So we we won't have the same uh, localization capabilities, but um, a, a, a very large sample. But will a localized an, an FRB that's localized with baseband have a reliable flux? Uh, hmm. Well, that's yeah, that's hard. Um, uh, we are working now with uh, holography data, so basically comparing uh, a pulsar detection with um, <laughs> with chime and with a, a single dish. And uh, in that way, we are modeling our uh, beam, our primary beam. Uh, so I think uh, as the work proceeds, at the beginning we will have like fluxes with large uncertainties, and uh, the more time we observe with the single dish, uh, the better these uncertainties uh, will be. Um, remember that we are we are well. Chime is a, cosmo a cosmological experiment uh, first, and they need to know the beam very well. So we are working with them to. Well, uh, our collaboration with the cosmologists will also help us to understand the chime beam uh, well enough. But for that, we will need, I think, a couple of years. 
I think like modeling the beam to that level has diminishing returns. I mean, these things are scintillating. So you're only going to measure it to a factor of order unity anyway. So I don't think you should kill yourself trying to model the beam to like 1% or 10%. Even. Oh, I'm not. We are, we are making the cosmologists do the work. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying you don't, <laughs> have to, you don't have to wait two years to measure fluxes. They are all off by, or, 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 they are all in error by order unity no matter even if you have perfect measurement, they're all scintillating. No, I completely agree. I think uh, th this is actually the plan for the catalog, and Vicky can correct me. It's like releasing a first version where the flux will have large uncertainties, and then we will uh, uh, improve on that uh, uh, as we as we uh, improve our beam model. Vicky, you seem to be hesitating about making a statement. I'm thinking about your point, actually. We have a very wide band and uh, not a lot of, in other words, the diffraction scintillation bandwidth is very small compared to our band. So if they're, if they're flux, if they're band limited, then I see your point. But if they're broadband, then I, I'm not sure I agree. And just have a little bit of scattering in the host and it's all off. You can get a broadband scintillation pattern. In the host, you can easily be in the transition between refractive and diffractive scintillation. Entirely possible. We have a couple of minutes left. Any other urgent comments that panel members want to make or other questions to address? Last one? Yeah. Last one. Yeah. Yeah, this is a big question, but we've sort of been circling around it. Can, can the panel comment on whether they think the, the optimal strategy is to sort of do big surveys in, in gamma rays, big surveys in X rays, big surveys in optical, try to cross match them and do statistics? Or is it really to go after? some number very deeply, because as, as was pointed out earlier, at the beginning of whatever, whichever GRB channel it was, the first four were confusing. It took a while before you had a lot. So I mean, what, what if we just never find anything, we get bored, we stop doing it? Or for, you know, you know what I mean? Like either there's limited resources and whatnot. So I wonder if you could comment on what people think might actually be the most efficient strategy in terms of finding the counter, multi-wavelength counterparts. Uh, I think possibly one of the most efficient strategies is to not is to actually not try to do a targeted search, but to uh, just look for coincidence observations with the wide field instruments like ZTF, like LAT. You know, you just kind of look after the fact. You know, these instruments that have really wide fields. That way, you don't have to ask for time. You just piggyback off of other observations. Uh, and that might be the least expensive method. Um, especially because, like in the case of ZTF, you know it covers the whole sky within a couple hours, so you have uh, a lot of data there to look back on. That's my thought. Um, I would just comment when when the the models aren't pinned down or you know known yet for what could be possible. Just a mix of strategies would be useful. So anything from cross correlating data streams that you get for free, like looking at the Fermi GBM stream, looking at the LIGO stream, cross-correlating both ways, um, that that's very useful and to some some extent for free, um, besides the, the infrastructure that you have to do to make that happen. And then also these targeted searches too. Um, the FRB event rate is, is very high, so it's a matter of just kind of putting alerts out there and seeing um, where various groups and trusts lie. I mean, that's the, the LIGO mode of operation now, at least. So I, I agree with uh, when Faye that you know I think the field is broad enough that multiple approaches need to be done and there are certainly enough number of people who are interested in it. Uh, my just cautionary note is that uh, don't try to follow every FRB. Have be discreet about which one you want to follow. Have a lot of discretion in there. It's it's good to like you know cast a wide net when you don't know what you're looking for, but you just have to be cautious about. Uh, if you find something weird, uh, make, making claiming an association because there's lots of weird things happening in the universe all the time. And if you don't have any prior probabilities or prior ex expectations for association, you'll likely get it wrong. Okay, on that cautionary note. <laughs> um, thank you to the panel members and for everybody for the discussion.